Can you look at me and tell what I am made of? Can you tell my ingredients? It's kind of like that, that nursery rhyme song, what are boys made of? Frogs, snails, and puppy dog tails. That's what boys are made of. I always hated that song because the girls are made out of sugar and spice and everything nice, and I'm made out of that junk. <laughs> anyway, can you look at me and tell my ingredients, what I am composed of? It's actually a rhetorical question. I'm glad none of you all tried to answer. It took me a while to come up, up with this lead-in. Anyway, the recipe of Ekandayo Bandali would contain things like Spike Lee movies, Chance the Rapper, a grilled skate with charred asparagus over a bed of stone ground grits at Wisteria. That's a restaurant in Atlanta. Mont Blanc Pins, The New Yorker, Toni Morrison, Bob Marley, playing spades with my family. My eldest daughter, Heshepsa, plays the game like she invented it. My youngest daughter, Ola Remy, her homemade cards, black coffee and oatmeal. Top Chef, love that show. John Michelle Basquiat. Those are some of the things that make up who I am. Those are my ingredients, my personal culture. We all have that a personal culture. It communicates things about ourselves to people, things like our level of education. Well, that may be a mis little misleading with me, seeing as I never got above my sophomore year in college. But if you were to look at my experiences and my library, it would suggest that of a, of a doctorate at best or a worldly man at least. Anyway, we all have that personal culture, and we have a culture that we share with other people, people from the same country as we're from, from the same socioeconomic class, from the same race, me. I am an African-American Gen Xer. And so the recipe of that, those ingredients include things like prints, um, plain dominoes and a haze of barbecue smoke in the backyard, HBCU homecomings, long church services, <laughs> a tribe called Quest, Freak Nick at Hotlanta. <laughs> I could run into any African-American Gen Xer, and more than likely, we have a couple of those cultural characteristics in common. It's our culture. Culture. It's such a loaded word these days. There's a public debate going on about culture. Some Southerners are saying that Confederate monuments are part of their culture, while in the Midwest, Native people are defending burial grounds that they say is part of their culture. Culture is simply defined as the arts and other manifestations of human intellectual achievement regarded collectively. How's that for a sophomore year education? So in 1965, there was a play, Douglas Turner Ward, A Day of Absence, opened on Broadway. It's a satire about a uh, fictionalized southern town where all of the black people suddenly disappear. I mean, in the, the athletes, the professionals, everybody, poof, gone. The, the white mayor goes to the airwaves and he begs everybody, come back home, come back home. Now, when we think of our culture, have you ever thought about measuring your cultural quotient? Actually trying to assess those ingredients. We all know of such a thing as an intelligence quotient. That's our IQ. It assesses our brain power. And then we, some of us know about our EI, our emotional intelligence. That measures how we regulate our emotions and those around the peop uh, people around us. But what of your cultural quotient, your CQ? Why is it even important for you, for you to be able to ramble off a list of your ingredients? I mean, many of us don't even know what our IQ is, and we don't walk around measuring our feelings, so we don't know even what our EI is is. But if we're not aware of our cultural quotient, our CQ, it may cause our life issues, problems. For instance, imagine with me that play, A Day of Absence. 
What if all the black people in the world suddenly just disappeared? All the black people from then and now. We have to ask ourselves, would there be a Celine Dion without a Diana Ross? Would there be an Elvis without a Chuck Berry? Would there have been a Colonel Sanders without my grandmama's cast iron fried chicken? <laughs> what would our cultural quotient be? I grew up in the era of rap. I myself was a rapper. My name was K-Kid Chillin'. Don't ask me where I came up with that moniker, but that's what I called myself. Anyway, I remember sitting out on the stoop with some friends listening to the boom box, and I heard this rap that mentioned a man named Richard Wright. I didn't know anyone named Richard Wright. I'd never heard of Richard Wright. Is he some hip-hop guru living up in the Bronx? So I decided to investigate, and I actually investigated in my eighth grade Spanish class. There I was in class with my nose pressed in the book of Richard Wright's Black Boy, completely ignoring what the teacher, Mrs. McDonald, was scribbling on the board. I actually didn't hear her call my name again and again and again. I ended up being suspended. My mom grounded me. She took my copy of Black Boy and gave me the Bible in its stead. But I have to ask myself, would I have been kicked out of school? Would I have been relegated to my bedroom with only the words of the prophets if my mother and Mrs. McDonald were aware of such thing as a cultural quotient? My literary curiosity flatlined until I attended Tennessee State University in Nashville. It happened in my sophomore year, which was my last year of college. Well, that's not entirely accurate. I did transfer to Morehouse, but that didn't stick. Anyway, in my second year, um, a man named Dr. James Birdsong gave me a, a little book. It was a collection of five black plays. That book resuscitated my cultural expansion, and it did so at a most critical time. I mean, like most black kids that were born and raised in the 70s, we grew up in the shadow of a mountain that was white culture. There's Shakespeare, there's General George Custer, there's George Washington, there's the Founding Fathers. There we are growing up in that shadow while being taught that our own culture was less than 100 years old, and that it was a molehill in comparison. But that little book and my brief time at Tennessee State University, it set me on a cultural quest of self-discovery. I started to write plays. I started to help people with their plays. I started to read black intellectuals, people like Ivan Van Sertema. Dr. Francis Cresswellsing, Dr. Yusef Binyakin. I was one of those brothers out on the yard with dreadlocks, smelling like patchouli, listening to Public Enemy, sporting red, black, and green paraphernalia. But even then, my cultural quotient wouldn't allow me to just confine myself to the bounds of an African-American Gen Xer. And that's what we do, isn't it? those of us with the flame of curiosity still burning in our chests, we go outside of ourselves to explore different things. I remember a friend of mine visited my dorm room. I had two posters on the wall, one of Malcolm X and one of William Faulkner. And my friend was like, bruh, what, what's up with the white dude on your wall? And I was like, bruh, say what you want, but that white dude can write. Have you read Absalom, Absalom? And, and that was the point. Steps along my cultural quest. I mean, Faulkner led me to Toni Morrison. Toni Morrison led me to Gabriel Garcia Marquez. There I was at the university where my focus was supposed to be my intelligence quotient, my IQ, but I was steadily developing my cultural quotient, my CQ. And it makes you ask, what about those kids who try and try and try again at college? And it just doesn't seem to stick. We try so hard because college is the natural progression after high school. We get in, we end up dropping out like I did, 
some of us feel like failures. Sometimes we feel dumb because we couldn't hack it with the books, but we're out there hacking it at something. It may not be our IQ. It could be our CQ or even our EI. And why should my understanding of applied mathematics be valued more than my understanding of Don Quixote? or my ability to write a play and let you into my world as an African-American Gen Xer. Culture. We're at a very important time of our history right now. There is a uh, term being used. It's called the Browning of America. It is the phenomena in which American minorities will soon become the American majority. The advent of President Barack Obama and that of his successor Donald Trump, it has aimed a magnifying glass on American culture. We recently had white supremacists marching and chanting, you shall not replace us. And you know what? They're right. We will not replace them. But if they could set aside their fear, their anger, what, their angst, whatever it is, and replace it with the beauty of cultural expansion, we can add to them. Think of it like this. Flour, oil, celery, onions, peppers, sausage, shrimp. Those things are just ingredients. But when they come together, they become something that they couldn't become on their own. Gumbo, Toni Morrison, Spike Lee, Gabriel Garcia Marquez. Those are my ingredients. And we as a nation have been adding ingredients to our pot for the last 100 years. Think of it. At the turn of last century, there were no black or brown people on Broadway. And if they were in film, they were in film as derogatory stereotypes. But by the 1950s, you had a brown person, a Cuban, Desi Arnaz, starring in one of our country's most beloved sitcoms, I Love Lucy. At the same time, Lorraine Hansberry's play, A Raisin in the Sun, it opened on Broadway. Right now, Lin-Manuel Miranda is redefining American musicals with his musical, Hamilton. We are exploding, culturally speaking. Where there was just one mountain, there are now dozens. African American culture is a mountain. Hispanic culture is a mountain. Native American culture, Pacific Islander, Asian. We are witnessing a cultural seismic shift. But are we pulling ourselves away from our computer screens, our tablets, and our phones long enough, not just to witness it, but to participate in it? We all know that having a low IQ could make it difficult for you to get that job that you want. Having a low EI could set you on an island where you don't want to be around people and people don't want to be around you. But what about your cultural quotient? What's the danger of having a low cultural quotient? Think about it like this. If you're only familiar with uh, uh, classical ballet, you may look at the dance form known as jukin and think of it as an amateurish counterfeit instead of a bona fide art form. We stunt the growth of our cultural selves when we deny experiences in other cultures and with other people. I don't think any of us would subject ourselves to the reality found in Douglas Turner Ward's play, A Day of Absence. And so I challenge all of us to not only become aware of our CQ, but to work at expanding it. Listen to Beethoven instead of Garth Brooks. Visit a synagogue during the high holy days. Why don't you record and binge watch later Greenleaf so that you can tune in to Vikings. Read Gabriel Garcia Marquez. Read Alexander Solzhenitsyn and discover the gulags in Russia. I promise you, 